I'm Lisa Palazzo from the Compliance Office, and I'm here today to talk about privacy management as it relates to education records. Specifically, we'll focus on FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. As this presentation will be recorded, I ask that you please hold your questions to the end after the camera and the microphone has been turned off. And at that time, I will also present some hypotheticals for us to discuss. To put the discussion of privacy and education records into a broader context, let's consider individuals' privacy expectations in general. Like many of you here, I, I would be upset if certain private information about me was generally broadcasted. My age, my weight, my health conditions, salary, grades I earn in classes that I may be taking while I work here at Case, it almost goes without saying that we want and expect those things to be private. This is very much a part of American culture, with laws protecting individuals' rights to privacy since the country's birth. It's, it's really connected to the expectation that we're in charge of our own personal lives, so therefore we're the proper custodians of information ab about ourselves. At our general issues in privacy in higher education session last month, we talked about we, how we as a, an active university legitimately come to possess a lot of sensitive information about individuals, such as students, staff, faculty, and even other people outside the university, such as alumni and donors, research collaborators from other institutions, sometimes even relatives of employees and students. We do need this information for our educational and research activities, but we also need to be aware of how it can be misused so that we can avoid the harms associated with that. All individuals and divisions within the case community are responsible for reporting information breaches and upholding our privacy policies and practices. In this playing field, our goals are to develop and maintain a comprehensive privacy program by identifying our risks, creating appropriate policies, providing training and guidance, and keeping informed of new legal developments and new technological developments. We've been taking steps in all of these areas. Today we're here to help train employees, and we hope that during the discussion following my presentation, um, I, we can, I, uh, you can help identify the university's risk areas. CASE has custody of a lot of personal information about individuals for various purposes. Add to the mix that due to the computer age, where and how we store that information is new and changing quickly. As more information is stored and transmitted electronically, securing it can be complicated and it's more vulnerable to theft and loss. Also, American colleges and universities are required to comply with many legal regulations on how we can collect and how we can store and use the personal information we have. And all this comes in the context of traditional university life where we've enjoyed openness and research, academic freedom, and the open dissemination of knowledge. So it can be a delicate balancing act to act properly, to behave properly, to manage the huge amount of individual's information we have. But with an active understanding of the requirements, we can work through what we need, what we need to do, what we should do to be proper stewards of the information we have. This slide lists some of the legal standards we're held to. I'm sure you've all heard of HIPAA. HIPAA stands for the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And it tells about how some organizations that hold individuals protected health information can use and disclose it. Under HIPAA, CASE is a hybrid entity. This means that some components of the university are subject to HIPAA, are regulated by it, must comply with it, while others are not. Those of you who work at CASE within a HIPAA covered entity may want to consider coming to next month's HIPAA targeted session. FERPA, the Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act tells about how elementary, secondary, and post-secondary schools should use and disclose students' education records. In this presentation, we'll be focusing on FERPA, specifically looking at its effect on institutions of higher education. 
Congress passed this act in 1974. And since then, unfortunately, there have been a lot of misconceptions, misunderstandings about what FERPA means, what it holds, and how schools should act to be consistent with it. Um, I hope that my talk will give clarity today. And first off, fundamentally, it's helpful for you to think of FERPA not as being about student privacy per se, but about privacy in the context of students' education records. Please keep that in mind as we go through FERPA in greater detail. So FERPA is about education records. For elementary school students, it gives their parents the right to have access to their children's records, the right to seek to have them amended, and the right to consent to the disclosure to third parties of personally identifiable information in those records, with certain exceptions. What's very important for us to know is when a student turns 18 or enters a post-secondary institution at any age, the rights under FERPA transfer from the parents to the student. Um, and, and that individual is called an eligible student under FERPA. So once an eligible student possesses the FERPA rights, their parents still may have certain rights in limited circumstances and at the institution's discretion. Generally, it's when, uh, when the student is a tax dependent of the parents or if there's a health or safety emergency involving the student. We'll talk about those scenarios in detail later. Public and private schools that receive federal Department of Education funding have to comply with FERPA if they want to continue receiving that funding. So FERPA does apply to Case Western because we receive some funds administered by the Department of Education. Again, FERPA is not about student privacy in the general sense, but it's written to protect information from students' education records. So in doing our jobs here and dealing with education records, it's important, obviously, then to understand how FERPA defines education record. Education records mean those files, documents, and other materials that are directly related to a student and are maintained by the educational institution. So this is a very broad definition. It, education records can include things like transcripts, exams, class schedules, but it also can, can extend to things like financial accounts, financial aid records, disciplinary records, in some contexts, photos and emails. In fact, recent amendments to FERPA widen the scope of an education record to include biometric information such as fingerprints, retina and iris patterns, and DNA sequences. So while the definition definitely is broad, it's not all-encompassing. One overarching concept is if a record is completely anonymized, scrubbed of all personally identifiable information, it's no longer a FERPA record. So that, that's one, one important thing to know. Other examples of things that are not education records are sole possession records. Um, these are records that are in the sole possession of the maker of an instru instructional supervisory or administrative person um, and, and a record that they don't share with anyone else. So a, a good example of this is if a professor teaches a large, um, you know, a la large lecture class of a couple hundred students, if they happen to keep a personal notebook, you know, remembering who's who, first names of the students, doesn't share that, those notes with anyone, those are sole possession records. That's not a FERPA record. Law enforcement unit records are not FERPA records. Specifically, these are law enforcement records created and maintained by the school's law enforcement unit for the purpose of law enforcement. So this would be, in case, our campus police, our campus security. Note, this is interesting. If the law enforcement unit shares the education record with another operational unit on campus, like uh, student discipline or residence life, those copies do become subject to FERPA. Alumni records. 
This is information about a student after they're no longer a student, after they graduate or they withdraw from the university. I, I want to emphasize personal observations. It's a myth that FERPA applies to all student information. It doesn't. It only, as I've said a couple of times, it only governs records and information from records, not information that's just generally observable, that's generally known about a student. To illustrate this, let's say um, the same professor who teaches in the lecture hall also has a SAGES, a small SAGES group. And she notices that one of the students has, um, is showing behavior changes, much quieter, withdrawn. Um, FERPA doesn't place any restrictions on who she can share those personal observations with. So she can, she can um, take appropriate steps to address her concerns about the student without, you know, without considering FERPA in this case. Student health records. This traditionally has been an area where there's been confusion. I'll, I'll generally go over um, what you need to know about this. So HIPAA excludes from its coverage any records that are subject to FERPA. FERPA excludes treatment records from the definition of education records. So what's a treatment record? Records made or maintained by a physician or psychiatrist or psychologist made or maintained or used in connection with the provision of treatment to the student. But the hitch is um, treatment records per are, are exempt under FERPA, are, are not covered by FERPA, so long as the medical professional does not share the records with anyone else. Uh, does not share with them with anyone else other than to those providing treatment. So to the extent that those treatment records are shared with others, within, even within the university, within the office, then they do become FERPA education records. So what this boils down to is for our purposes at this university, for example, in the student health services, those, we, we consider those records FERPA records. And uh, that unit is aware of that. So far, we have an understanding of what education records are under FERPA and the fact that it's our students that hold the FERPA rights. Now we'll get deeper into FERPA and see more about how CASE manages situations, specific situations related to education records. FERPA gives the right to have access to one's education records, the right to seek to have them amended, and the right to consent to the disclosure to third parties of those records. It also establishes the right to file a complaint with the U.S. Department of Education if one or more of those first rights are denied. We'll talk about each of these four items individually. In looking into the FERPA right to have access to one's own education records, we consider situations where an eligible student might want to see their education record, whether there are limits on what they can see and how the request process works here. One of the whys, one of the reasons behind FERPA is to allow people to challenge the content of their education records to make sure they're accurate, to give them an opportunity to correct them or, or delete information from them um, if, if, they're, um, if they're misleading or, or inaccurate. The specific scenarios that um, this can arise in, requests for access, are as numerous as there are offices really here uh, at the university. Students and, and even their parents often contact different case offices to find out about a bill, a health plan payment, a housing damage report, hearing documents from a student conduct matter, or even to access grades. FERPA says that a school must comply with the request to inspect and review it. Um, education records within 45 days of receiving the request. So FERPA doesn't have a lot of hard deadlines, but this is one of them, the 45 day. In, in reacting to this request, it's generally okay for a school just to allow the eligible student to view the records. Generally, the school doesn't have to provide copies. Schools would be 
would only be required to give copies or, or make other arrangements um, if failure to do so kind of would effectively prevent the student from having access. For example, if the student happens to be um, on an internship in another state or studying overseas at the time. It may seem obvious, but FERPA explicitly sets it out for us. Schools may not destroy records if a request for access is pending. And if the record, if a, a student's education record contains information on other students too, the school has to, to block out the information on the other students before letting the requester see it. There are certain education records that FERPA explicitly says higher ed students may not see. Financial records of their parents that the school may be keeping, for example, in the financial aid office, and also certain confidential um, recommendation letters for admission or for you know, other per recommendation letter purposes. Post-secondary schools like us are required to annually notify our students of their FERPA rights. And we do this on the web pages of our university registrar. The pages include an explanation of rights under FERPA, the process for requesting review of education records, and also the process um, of amending them. In looking into the FERPA right to have one's education record amended, we, we think about situations where they might want to change or add to an education record, what FERPA says about this, and how that amendment process works here. Again, as we mentioned when discussing situations where one might want access, the reasons for wanting to amend can be, can be numerous. To request that an education record be amended, FERPA says, and this stands to reason, I think, that the eligible student needs to identify the portion of the record believed to contain the misleading information or the inaccurate information. Then the school has a reasonable time, a reasonable time period to decide whether to make that change as requested. So we don't have a hard and fast deadline as we did in, in the access. We can take a reasonable time. Um, what that reasonable time period is, um, I'm not sure, but... Um, FERPA does give universities quite, quite wide discretion, so I, I would think that um, that would apply here too. If the school decides not to amend, they must inform the eligible student of their right to have a hearing. And after the hearing takes place, if the school's decision is still not to amend, the eligible student does have a right to insert their own statement into the education record. As I mentioned, the, our, our university registrar's web pages explain the process for amending. So thus far, we've reviewed treatment of education records as between the school itself and the student, okay, the, that direct relationship. Now we're going to shift our focus to when an outside third party requests access to a student's education record. As summarized on this slide, it's helpful to keep in mind, FERPA requires a school to give students access to the records. When it comes to letting third parties get access to those records or information from them, it's always going to be discretionary on the part of the school. I really think this is the crux of what a lot of people um, in the community and in the larger community too think of when they hear the word FERPA, the rules regarding how schools can share information from education records with outsiders. The general rule of FERPA, FERPA generally holds that institutions cannot release to outsiders personally identifiable information contained in education records without the written consent the specific consent of the eligible student, but there are exceptions. So important for you to understand is even if a student has consented to the disclosure of their personally identifiable information to outside third parties, it's still within the university's discretion to, to not do it, to not make that disclosure. There may be other university considerations and priorities where even though we would be allowed to do it under the law, we may choose not to.
FERPA has certain requirements for a written consent document to be valid. So for a student's written consent to be valid, it must be signed and dated by the student. It must specify the records that may be disclosed, state the purpose of the disclosure, and identify the recipient of the information, either the specific recipient or the class of recipients. So I've been talking about personally identifiable information. FERPA says that a signed consent form is needed before an institution like us can release personally identifiable information from education records to outsiders. But what is personally identifiable information? Or I call it PII for short. It can be any information that has the effect of identifying a particular student. It, it, PII can be information that contains direct identifiers, like um, name, address. It also can, can um, be indirect identifiers, identifiers that simply would have the effect of identifying a particular student. And the standard is whether a reasonable person in the school community, that is someone with personal knowledge of the circumstances, could use that information to identify the student. But there's a type of PII that's generally not considered an invasion of privacy if, if it's disclosed. And that's called directory information. You may have heard that, that phrase from FERPA. Directory information is, is what it sounds like. Information you might find in a student directory or some other document that a school would normally um, make open to the public, like a yearbook or a playbill or an F, uh, a sports program. It could include items um, listed on this slide. On the flip side, FERPA says directory information cannot include a student's social security number and generally not a student ID number. So this is important to know because schools may adopt a directory information policy that allows for the disclosure of certain directory information to specific parties or specific, you know, for specific purposes outside the university, but um, What's, what's required of the, the school is that they publish that directory information policy and they give students a reasonable time to opt out. So while um, specific written consent wouldn't be required in cases of directory information, the student is giving actual consent by, by not opting out. The Case Western Reserve notice regarding directory information can be found on the registrar's pages. The web pages specifically identify what our university defines as directory information. So this, these are the items of directory information as, as set out by Case Western. The website includes information for students who would prefer to opt out, who would prefer that the university never release their um, information. Um, it gives instructions on how to update their FERPA restriction by going to the student information system. There are a number of exceptions to FERPA's rule requ requiring getting the student's specific consent before the institution can share information from education records with someone outside. Consent of the eligible student is not required when disclosing certain records to certain persons. Um, but remember, disclosure would still be discretionary on part of the university. Here, this slide shows some of the exceptions to the consent requirement. I bolded the first one because it, it comes up often. Disclosures to school officials with legitimate educational interests. FERPA says that institutions may share students' education records internally with other school officials, including teachers within the institution who've been determined to have a legitimate educational interest in the, in the student. 
Our annual notification here at, here at Case says, a school official has a legitimate educational interest if the official needs to review an education record in order to fulfill his or her professional responsibility. So Case staff and faculty may disclose education records to other staff and faculty who need that information to perform the duties of their jobs. For example, faculty should and do turn in grades to the registrar so that they can process the students' grades. Um, imagine if the law school and Weatherhead had a partnership and, um, you know, where, where students could be enrolled in classes at both, both um, schools. It would be appropriate in many cases then for professors between those two schools to, to share education records. I won't go specifically through all of these items because I think they're, they're pretty obvious. Um, more exceptions to parents of a dependent student. Remember earlier when I said that once an eligible student possesses FERPA rights, there are certain limited circumstances where parents still may be able to access information from the records. One such circumstances, circumstance is when the student is a tax dependent of the parents then the university may disclose education records to parents without the student's consent. Of course, the university should first verify the student's tax-dependent status, and it's still at the university's discretion. The parents can't demand to see the education. Well, they could demand, but um, they don't have the right to access them. It's the right to grant access would still be discretionary on the university's part. If a student is under 21 years of age, a university may inform their parents of the student's violation of its alcohol and drug policies, regardless of whether the child is a tax dependent, and regardless of whether or not it's an emergency situation. Um, I want to call out the, the exception in red, a health or safety emergency. When a university has a good faith belief that there's a health or safety emergency, we're permitted to disclose information from education records to anyone we reasonably believe could help manage that emergency, even those outside the university. So this is one of those misunderstandings um, that I think people had about FERPA. And we also talked about directory information. So directory, if what we're disclosing is directory information, we don't have to get the student's specific written consent for the disclosure of directory information, but we do have to verify that they did not opt out of the directory information policy. The web pages of our university registrar include really helpful resources regarding FERPA, including a 10-minute training video explains how employees should handle specific record request situations. I encourage you to visit those pages frequently to keep your awareness of FERPA up to date. In the last few minutes, I just want to make a few more points about FERPA to ensure your picture of it is complete. FERPA requires universities to keep records of each request for access um, and each disclosure that we make from education records, but we don't have to do this for um, disclosures made with consent. Even when FERPA permits an institution to disclose PII to an outside third party, the recipient isn't, isn't really free to distribute that information however it wants. When, in that situation, when we do disclose PII to an outside party, um, we should inform the recipient that that information should not be transferred to others without the eligible student's written consent. There are certain exceptions to that, though, certain situations. So how is FERPA enforced? Eligible students may file a written complaint with the Family Policy Compliance Office, the FPCO, that's housed within the Department of Education if they, if they want to allege that one of their FERPA rights was violated. But in order for that complaint to be considered, the eligible student has to submit the complaint within 180 days of the alleged incident. So that's the other um, deadline we see. 
The FPCO is the arm that investigates FERPA complaints and FERPA potential violations. Um, so long as the eligible student timely files the complaint, the FPCO will investigate it and may bring an enforcement action against that entity. If the office finds an institution non-compliant with FERPA, it will issue a notice of findings, including steps that the institution should take to be in compliance. Uh, it normally would give a reasonable time period for the institution to achieve compliance. If the entity still doesn't achieve compliance within that, within that set time period, then the secretary of the Department of Education may withhold payment under any current Department of Education funding programs. Um, there are also other legal remedies like issuing a complaint to compel compliance um, or terminate the university's eligibility to receive future funding. This talk today really covered the basics of FERPA in relation to how most of us should handle education records and requests for access. It's really an interesting law, and there are a number of helpful references if any of you want to dig in deeper to any particular area of FERPA, such as the interaction between FERPA and HIPAA or school safety issues relating to FERPA. I thank you for your attention and um, encourage you to reach out to me. Um, I'll have my contact information at the end. And... Um, if any of you think this information would be valuable to your colleagues back in your office or your department, um, I can come out and, and give, it, uh, give a targeted presentation to you.